No man wants to fail as a father any more than a home builder wants to build a house that collapses in the first storm of the season. But just like a builder needs a good blueprint for a house, Christian fathers need a blueprint for how to succeed as a father. Let me explain. When it comes to viewpoints on fatherhood, there are many options today. The Christian idea of what it means to be a dad faces fierce competition from the many diverse other views in the world. But only one of those alternatives is from God, and that one is found in the Bible. In this episode, I'm going to tell you about the biblical blueprint for fatherhood and how it can guarantee you success as a dad. This is Worldview Legacy, the show that helps Christian men become the worldview leaders their families and churches need. My name is Joel Sedecase, and I'm here to help you, the Christian layman, to build a legacy so that you, your kids, and your wife will be able to confidently answer the world's questions from the Bible, and as you do, you will see Jesus change lives as you share your faith. Today, we will answer how the Bible's blueprint for fatherhood can guarantee you success as a dad. Building a worldview legacy as a Christian man means understanding certain things. You have to understand what God says a man is, and what a father is, and what God expects from fathers. Understanding that blueprint will help you to build your household. It will help you to become the kind of father that God wants you to be. Today, you're going to hear a new version of a talk I gave at a recent AWOL men's discussion group. This talk is for men, it's for dads, it's for aspiring fathers, and if you've ever felt frustrated by all the competing options and opinions telling you how to be a dad, this episode is for you. You need a solid answer from God's Word, and that is what you're going to get. Specifically, I'm going to answer these questions. Who is the archetypal father in Scripture other than God Himself? What are the three parts of the Bible's blueprint for fatherhood? What does success look like for Christian fathers and how can you achieve it? What does spiritual leadership look like? What matters more to God, outcome or obedience? And finally, what can you do if you never saw godly fatherhood growing up? Now, I've been hosting AWOL discussion nights for a while now, and you can do it too. It's a ton of fun. You can do it however you want with cigars, bourbon, beer, coffee, sitting around a bonfire in your basement while you grill out. You can do it in a pub, wherever. But it's iron sharpening iron no matter where you do it. It is awesome. And to help encourage you to have a discussion night like the ones that I have, with some other guys. I want to help you. I would like to give you a PDF version of my short discussion guide. It's six questions crafted by me, and I guarantee they will help you enjoy a robust, really enjoyable discussion with other guys if you use it. I'll tell you how to get that at the end of this episode. All right, let's get into it. What is a father? This question is going to be answered differently by different cultures, and it can definitely be tough to sort through. In its most basic definition, a father is a male parent. In the Bible, the concept of fatherhood is very, very important. God himself is called father. And the archetypal father in the Bible, other than God the father, is Abraham. In Genesis 18, 19, God lays out a blueprint for godly fatherhood. And in this blueprint, God says three things about Abraham, which teach us about how God himself views the role of a father. He says, For I have chosen him, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham all that he has spoken upon him. So God's blueprint for fatherhood has three parts, authority, discipleship, and legacy. By pursuing these three things, you can make sure that you are following God's blueprint for fatherhood. And in the process, you can ensure that you will have success as a dad. Success for Christian fathers comes not from the results, but from faithfulness. And we find this principle illustrated in the Bible. In Proverbs 16, 1, for example, which says, The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from God. We also see it in John 14, 5, where Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments or you will keep my commandments. If you want to show Jesus that you love him, obey him. Leave the results up to him. 
He will establish your steps if you commit your ways to him. And he will give you the answer that he wants you to have. He's good. You can trust him. By the way, the outcome that he's going to come up with is always going to be far better than anything that you and I could have come up with anyway. That is biblical success. Now, let's break down the three parts of this blueprint. Here's the first part, authority. God is the ultimate authority, and Abraham reflected this attribute in his own authority. Abraham had a position of authority over his children, and not only over his own children, but over his whole household. And actually, there were at least 318 men in his household. These were trained men, men of war. They actually went to war with Abraham, which we can read about in Genesis 14, 14. These men were so loyal to Abraham that they were actually circumcised along with him, Genesis 17, 27. And I got to tell you, there's not too many guys that I would be that loyal to. That's that's pretty intense. Uh, Abraham also had others in his household too. He had a broad sphere of influence. He had people that he was responsible for in his household over whom he had authority. Now, this authority was not self-directed. It was not self-chosen. It was not selfish, but rather it was granted by God for his purposes. Success as a father comes when you embrace your God-given authority like Abraham did. That's not to say that your children might never rebel against your authority, but again, success for Christian dads comes from faithfulness, not the results, not the outcome. Okay, so now for the second part of the blueprint, discipleship. Discipleship, this is all about spiritual leadership and education. See, God is the ultimate spiritual leader and teacher. Abraham was to reflect that role in his own fatherhood. He was to instruct the members of his household. He had the role of a teacher. So that tells you something. That means it's not just the role of the mother, even if your wife homeschools, for example. It doesn't, the buck doesn't stop with her. It stops with the dad. And this is reflected in the Torah, in Deuteronomy 6. It's reflected in Ephesians 6. You know, the other day I came up from my office, which is downstairs, and I saw my kids and my wife, Elisa, sitting around on the couch. We homeschool in our house, and I say we, but really it's her. And Elisa was reading to the kids, and the kids were absolutely enthralled by what she was reading. She's been reading them this book, Farmer Boy, by Laura Ingalls Wilder. Elisa is educating them, and I don't know anything about Farmer Boy. I feel like I'm catching up. I had to ask, you know, what's it about? What's going on in this story? And I often feel like that. I feel like I'm playing catch up. Maybe as a dad, you feel the same way sometimes, whether your kids go to school outside the home or especially if they're homeschooled. Now that's actually to be expected from time to time, because if your wife is taking the role of being the primary teacher and you've got another job that you've got to do, you're not going to be up on every single thing that they're doing. That's okay. If your wife is educating your kids, you may feel out of the loop, but This only highlights the importance of what we are supposed to teach our kids and really take ownership of. Yes, ultimately the onus falls on us, falls on the dads for our kids' education, for every aspect of the kids' education. The dad is responsible for what the kids learn, even if the wife is the primary educator. That's still true. We still have to take that responsibility. But when it comes to spiritual education, The dad is not only responsible, he takes the lead. And I know all education is ultimately theological and spiritual, but I'm talking about discipleship. I'm talking about family worship, catechism, scripture memory. The ways that you lead your family in this can look different. They can look diverse. It might also mean volunteering in your kid's Sunday school ministry at church. That's actually something that I do. But the nucleus of it is going to be your family worship times. For our family worship, we keep it simple. We read scripture, we pray, and we sing. God said that he chose Abraham to teach his children how to keep the way of the Lord. They needed to know what their primary allegiance was. And that was not to Abraham, but it was to God. A good father directs his family toward God, upwards. This is how we make disciples. This is how we make disciples of Jesus. And that's actually what Jesus commissioned us to do in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. 
And the example of Abraham shows us that this process of discipling the nations begins at home. The father is to teach his children how to function as disciples. And he's also supposed to teach them how to function as a godly society. You know, God says that Abraham is is supposed to teach his children to do righteousness and justice. You know, this is external godly living, godly living in society. God is using Abraham to build up a society and even a civilization. All right. So the third part of the blueprint then is building a legacy. God had a plan for history. He has a plan for history. This is a legacy that he's been building in real time. And in Abraham's day, he was going to use Abraham and his fatherhood to build it. Abraham's children and the younger members of his household were going to outlast him. They were going to be around after he had died. What Abraham taught his children then would live on. That meant that his kids and his grandkids and his great-grandchildren wouldn't have to figure these things out for themselves again. And they wouldn't have to go on the same journey that Abraham went on. If you know the story of Abraham, he, Abraham, he did a lot of wandering. Abraham went on that journey himself. And he spoke with the Lord, the Lord spoke with him, and then Abraham taught his children what the Lord had taught him. This is a legacy, and this is a legacy that is planned by the Lord. We see this right in the passage. This is what the Lord has spoken about Abraham. Abraham's legacy then was in the Lord's hands. Abraham could trust God with the outcome. Abraham had been taught to trust the Lord with himself, and now He was going to have to trust the Lord with his family's future too. God was going to use him to bring about his plan. See, this legacy will happen just exactly as God has planned it. God didn't need Abraham in the sense that God could have chosen anyone. However, God chose him. And in that, God actually bound up his own reputation with Abraham's faithfulness. This is pretty cool. The choices that Abraham would make would bring about God's plan. If Abraham were to choose differently, God's plan wouldn't have been accomplished. And yet, God saw to it that Abraham would remain faithful. There's sovereignty and human responsibility going on here. So you see, the principle here is that successful, godly fathers acknowledge their place in God's plan. And they seek to bring their family in line with what God is doing. They see their whole family as being on mission together on mission to bring the gospel to their local area, to pass on the Christian worldview to the younger generation, to use their gifts to build up the local church. So as you pursue this, if God blesses this, your worldview legacy is going to last many generations after you're gone. Doesn't that sound compelling? Doesn't that sound amazing? That is what Abraham experienced. But remember, success as a dad is not about the outcome. It's more about obedience. So now, Let's look at a couple of potential objections here. You might say, yeah, but you know what? I'm not Abraham. I don't have that kind of plan for my life. Well, look, it's true that you aren't Abraham, and yet you are an inheritor. You're an heir of what God started through Abraham. You're part of that same story. Abraham was supposed to reflect God's fatherhood as a father, and he did that. Even though the details of your fatherhood and your particular piece of God's story differs from from Abraham's. The pattern is still the same. All fatherhood comes from the original pattern of God the Father. This is what it means to be a father, to reflect the fatherhood of God. All fatherhood comes from him. Now, some might say that the idea of the father as an authority in the home, you know, that's okay for God, but nowadays in the home, in the family, that seems outdated. This seems like something that our society has moved past, but I'll tell you this, even if our society has largely moved past the biblical idea of fatherhood, we haven't advanced beyond it. Why? Because it's impossible to advance beyond or to improve upon God's perfect plan. God's plan is perfect. You can't get any higher than God's plan. Now, it is very possible that you have not seen fatherhood like this. You wouldn't even know where to start. I get that. Maybe your dad wasn't a great father growing up. Well, God helps you. 
This is why God gave us the Bible. This is why God gave us Abraham and Proverbs. Proverbs is actually written as kingly advice to a son. You know, God the Father himself is a father. He will help you. He's also given us his spirit. The spirit of God empowers us, enables us to be able to be the kind of dad that God wants us to be. Even if you didn't have a great earthly father who really met that mold, who followed the the blueprint, God's grace will cover you. God's Holy Spirit will help you. And guess what? When you fail, his grace is there because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. God's mercies for fathers are new every single morning. And Jesus Christ himself is called everlasting father. Why is that? He's called that in Isaiah, and yet Jesus never had any physical children. So why is he called the the everlasting father? Well, remember the role, the threefold blueprint for fatherhood. Jesus is the authority. He's the ultimate authority. Jesus is the ultimate disciple maker, you know, spiritual leader, and no one built a bigger and better legacy than Jesus Christ. Jesus laid down his life to redeem a people for himself. He paid the ransom for our sin to restore us to God. Jesus rose from the dead. He conquered death and he solidified his position as our king. Now, every godly father pursues godly fatherhood by pursuing Jesus. And then as if that wasn't enough, God has given us a community of other dads to learn from. So if you didn't have a great dad growing up, get into the men's ministry at your church. Find other men to connect with, guys who love the Lord, guys who are in the word and can help disciple you. You know, that's one of the reasons why I host and co-host these uh, men's discussion groups, these AWOL groups. It's to foster that brotherhood, that community, that fellowship. The biblical blueprint of fatherhood has three parts, authority, discipleship, and legacy. It all comes from God and it all points back to God, God the Father. The way that fatherhood is expressed is going to vary from one culture to another. That's true. But the Bible says that the ultimate blueprint, the definition and the example all come from God. God is the ultimate authority. So successful fathers obey him. God is the ultimate disciple making spiritual leader. So successful fathers follow him and learn from him. And God is the ultimate legacy builder. So godly fathers seek to guide their families according to God's plan on God's mission. God has given you a blueprint for fatherhood in his word. And if you follow it, you will be successful. Because again, success is about obedience, not outcome. So now you know. Abraham is the archetypal father in scripture, other than God himself. The three parts of the Bible's blueprint for fatherhood, which we see in the story of Abraham, are authority, discipleship, and legacy. Success for Christian fathers looks more like obedience and less like getting the right outcome because we leave the outcome to God. And you can achieve success by obeying God's blueprint, by repenting and getting back on track when you fail all by God's grace through Jesus Christ. We've seen that spiritual leadership in your home may take different forms, but it can be as simple as reading the Bible with your kids and praying and singing a song. And if you never saw godly fatherhood growing up, God has given you the resources that you need. He helps you through scripture, his spirit, Jesus Christ, and a community of other fathers. Now, if you want to increase your fellowship with other men who are on that same journey of building a worldview legacy in their homes, then get yourself a copy of the PDF of the six questions that I used to moderate our AWOL discussion on fatherhood. Do it now so you can host your own group this spring, just in time for the weather to get warmer. It's going to be the perfect weather for bonfires, grilling out, sitting around outside, smoking pipes and cigars. It's going to be perfect. And here's how you can get your hands on that PDF. All you have to do is to join our free group on Facebook, The Think Squad, T-H-I-N-K-S-Q-U-A-D. 
Answer those membership questions that come up, and when you answer them, just mention the word FATHERHOOD in all caps, anywhere in that area, in that section. I will know what that means, and I will then email you a copy of the short discussion guide. So, thanks for listening to Worldview Legacy. This episode was produced by me, Joel Sedekase, and is a production of the Think Institute.